Welcome to Association Chat, a podcast devoted to talking about all things associations, nonprofits, and the future for building communities. In a world where there's an association for everything, that gives us a lot to talk about. So let's get started with your host, Kiki Latalian. Thank you to Mike at Podcasting for Associations for the production of this podcast. So today I get the wonderful opportunity to talk with Jane Oates. She's the president of Working Nation. She's a former Obama administration assistant secretary of employment and training for the U.S. Department of Labor. And Jane, thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, Kiki, I'm delighted and excited. I'm excited too. You know, we had the great opportunity to meet and talk on a panel for Q Career that was moderated uh, in Washington, D.C. And I just, I was fascinated by a lot of the stories that you had to share. Can you tell people a little bit more about what Working Nation is and, and really what the mission is? Because it's a nonprofit. Absolutely. It is a nonprofit created by a philanthropist, Art Bilger, who really saw the looming danger of structural unemployment, the effect of longevity in the workforce, globalization, technology, and a work and an educational system that wasn't exactly connected to the needs of employers. And Art decided to start this enterprise, a nonprofit media enterprise, to tell the stories not only of the looming threats that automation may bring to job, you know, the numbers of jobs and different sectors, but also to the amazing solutions that are everywhere. So that storytelling about solutions is basically who Working Nation is. And that's why, that is why you have those great stories, because you're out there hearing them all the time, collecting those to say, hey, guys, this is what's working. This is, this is where things are, you know, helping people to change their lives and to solve this, this huge problem that every industry is facing today. That's exactly right. And we are so fortunate to have world-class storytellers in terms of journalists and executive producers in video and telling those stories. You know, every we've, we've had forever really good uh, white papers, really good conceptual papers. But what we do is different. We do, our talented staff at Working Nation tell the stories of people through video storytelling, short five minute or less documentaries. And it really gets to the heart of the story, not just the, the cold hard facts about where the best training is and where the jobs of the future are. So I want to dig into that a little bit more and get a little bit more specific because, you know, associations, when, when we talk about associations, they're representing every industry that's out there. That, that is, so it's very hard to get specific, but we know that associations, especially trade associations, they can play a, a bigger role than what they're playing today in something like the employment pipeline, in helping people to, helping employers to find the right employees for the future. And so can you talk to me about where you're seeing some some good stories, some positive stories happen where industries, associations are working together to to bring reskilled, upskilled employees into uh, the right positions for their employers? Sure. And, you know, aside from you being fabulous and so charismatic, one of the things that excited me so much about our conversations was the fact that you're dealing with associations. I think associations play a critical role in both getting the message out and also defining the needs. So let me give you a couple of very specific examples. I think I would be remiss if I didn't start with the Manufacturing Institute and the National Association of Manufacturers. They were out there very early and very clearly describing the need that was then impending, but now upon us, of workers in critical areas. And they not only talked about the need, but then they dug in and they got into very 
very specific looks at what credentials mattered in their industry. And I bring them up because, you know, people think about manufacturing and they think of the big recognizable names. But the reality is that the jobs that are being created are being created by smaller or smaller employers in manufacturing and other sectors. And the the NAM group really embraces those smaller employers and they don't have the the ability to have a, a very high functioning multi employee team to do the training and do the diagnostics and and even doing the HR so the association really came in and said this is what we need this is how we need to assess it and recognize it these are the credentials that do that the best and this is how to get a job with our employers both large and small. I think they did a great job. They're not alone. I mean, I'll go to another sector and then take a breath and and let you <laughs> dig in a little bit. But I, I love think, these. I love yeah. this. That's no, wonderful. I mean, and I think CompTIA does the same thing in the tech space. And tech is so interesting to me because it's both its own sector and it's a horizontal. It's a part of every sector. But how do you know what tech credentials you need to get into fill in the blank, data analytics, cybersecurity, networking? So should I take a course in Tableau or should I do MuleSoft? And CompTIA, first of all, offers some assessment, but also, you know, and great assessments in a, uh, a great majority of the fields, but they also have great expertise in saying, you know, these are the industries that are more interested in coding with Java, and these are the industries that are more interested in coding with Ruby on Rails. So I think two very different trade associations, but both uh, doing a tremendous job. And I could give you 10 more examples because, as I say, I love the associations. Yeah, well, you know, and, and these are great examples because one of the frustrations that we run into is figuring out, yeah, what kind of credentials do I need? What should I pursue? It's it's uh, not just a problem or a question of whether we need to continue learning. I think a lot of us understand that that's, that's part of the game now is that we have to have this ongoing learning. But, you know, where do we even begin? Because there are so many different options. And I can imagine that, and well, I don't even have to imagine. I can say that for myself, when I look at what do what skills do I want to bring on? It seems like there's such a wide variety that offering things like these assessments, like you were talking about CompTIA offering, can be really helpful, you know, on the side of the associations trying to match up, okay, pay attention to this type of credential. This will help you in this type of industry. That's correct. That's exactly right. And, you know, for your audience, the people that are job seekers, if you are looking to get a credential, you should make sure that the credential is recognized by employers. If mm -hmm. it's not, it's probably not worth your time or money. Yeah, it's such a such an important thing, too, because, you know, it, they are not all created the same. And That's so, right. and I think that a lot of people, I, they get they get lost in all of the acronyms, all of the credentials, all of the different certifications that they can get. And it's really important to think, what's going to get me hired? You know, what are the things that people are hiring for? What are they looking for today? That's so, exactly right. So on that, you know, one of the things, one of the issues that we see coming into the forefront is that higher education, a lot of people who are imagining that they're going, they're going to get their, their degrees, they're going to go get their bachelors, even their associates, they're imagining that they're going to immediately have a job that's available for them after school. And it's not always the case anymore. And so it is becoming more and more important that they start to think about, students start to think about, you know, what is going to make me more employable after I leave college, after I leave post-secondary. And associations can play a role in that. The problem is most people or many people don't know what associations are, <laughs> you know, right, and that's right. 
that visibility problem is a problem. Do you see that changing at all? Or, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on on associations and their visibility problem when it comes to addressing this issue in workplace workforce challenges? So I'm really excited about how associations are growing and changing. They used to be, in the olden days, much more insular, only speaking to their members and only speaking at events that were their closed events. I think the change we're seeing is that associations are out there talking about the benefit of membership in their association externally. So they're talking to a wider audience about the benefits of their industry and, you know, the great you know, benefits that their companies bring to their local communities, both individually and using the association to have a larger footprint. So that's number one. Number two, I see more and more of the associations beginning uh, student memberships and driving mm-hmm. young people who think they might be interested and not so young people. I mean, I don't think it's just age, but can they get involved in the content of the association before they're actually employed in that. And and lastly, I would say that I think associations are looking much more at supply chain. And therefore, they're using that as a distribution channel, not only for their product, but for information about their association. And what I mean by that is they understand that their companies are not just in a silo creating a product or delivering a service in that limited targeted area, but they are instead, you know, doing a lot in communications and doing a lot in public relations and doing a lot in government relations. And therefore, I'm seeing a lot of the associations band together on common causes. So, So some of them could be climate change, some of them could be government regulation, some of them could be things like targeted populations, like getting ex-offenders back into full employment or retraining women for the workforce or veterans. So I think that those three things coming together have made associations look more, maybe the word I'm looking for is relevant to everybody, Mm -hmm. not just the members of their association, but these associations are really there for the greater good of the economy, of the community, of the country. Oh, I love hearing that. And I know that everyone who's listening to this will love hearing that too. So we're on the right path. Things are changing, but things need to change a whole lot more. And one of the big challenges that um, is I, I, even more difficult to address is, is this while we know that we need to be these lifelong learners, not everybody's up for it. You know, like, I mean, imagine that you take the assessment, imagine that you know, you know, exactly what credential that you need to go to, to help you go forward to make you more employable. But that doesn't mean that you want to. And I think that one of the issues that we see is that not everybody wants training, So even if we have associations working together, you know, and and coming up with some great programs, I listened to something, an interview that you did, and you were talking about Rutgers and their, their, is it the Heldrick program that's there? The Heldrick Center, right. Their new career start network, yes. Yeah. And so I definitely want to talk about that. But but I want to, you know, what about this issue where not everybody wants the training? Have you seen how any associations or, or any organization really has been able to appeal to people who feel really tired and they're like, you know what, I am you know, 43 years old and I don't feel like going to get more training right now. Right. Right. Well, you brought up the uh, the Heldrick Centers program led by uh, Maria Heidekamp and Carl Van Horn, two leaders in this field, and they decided that they were going to put their efforts in older workers, 55 and older, who had been long term mm-hmm. unemployed. And we could all look at this. You know, you bring up 44 people who think they played by the rules and they 
got the right education, but something happened and their company went under and they can't figure out how to reinvent themselves. So I think, you know, the Rutgers program, and I hope it gets replicated all over the place. The key element there is one-on-one mentoring. They Mm -hmm. make sure that somebody takes a personal interest in that dislocated worker, in that case, long-term dislocated worker, and gives them the personal confidence that they can be a player in a new field. So I think their research that will be, and I'm sure they'll be doing lots of writing about it now that they're in their third year, I think their research will be really informative to both uh, associations and nonprofits who really want to zone in on this population. No different than we've seen tremendous groups like Opportunity at Work and Year Up do that with young people, you know, coming out of, they call them Opportunity Youth or STARS, uh, but to give them the confidence that they can really make it in the workforce. But I think associations, I don't know of any stories. I I hope that your listeners get back to you and say, oh, she didn't know about this. I want to bring this up to you. And you'll have lots of rich (laughs) follow-up podcasts. But I think the key here is to get to the individual. The stories that Working Nation has told really get individuals who understand that they have a critical role in their own continuing development. They have to put out the effort. They have to be interested in still being, you know, a a real thriving member, not only of the economy, but of their own life. You know, they can't, they can feel badly for getting laid off. Absolutely. Anybody who's been laid off knows that it's a debilitating experience. But it really is, you have to pick yourself up and you have to get a new plan, envision where you want to be, envision what you want to be, and then have a detailed plan about how to get there. Now, that leads us right back to associations, right? I mean, associations can be great aggregators of the skills necessary to get a job in the sector or sectors that they represent. If these people can see that plan, have the personal resilience and grit to do it, they should be successful. Yeah. I I mean, I I can see it. I see that it makes sense. It's logical. It's rational. And there, (laughs) there are still a lot of associations that have yet to maybe maximize that, that opportunity to provide that as a benefit to current members and potential members in the future. You know, I think that um, it's interesting when we think about the way that we've always, you know, we've always benefited from being able to continue our learning. But it seems that with technology making such dramatic shifts that now, of course, you know, within the next three to five years, you're, you can count on, even if you've get, you've got the social media skills and you understand SEO and you understand this, things will be changing. They'll change faster than that. And so exactly. this need to not just be open to continuing that learning, but to understanding, you know, that if this is a skill, if this is an industry that you want to continue in, that you have to continuously go back go back and and continue to you know upskill reskill learn new skills so That's that right. you're marketable so that you're employable and, and association to time. Are, are, yeah, they have the opportunity to be the great aggregators of those skills That's you right. know, and we're at a point in time that you know one thing we it, talked about at that panel we were on was um you know how apprenticeships are becoming more common in non-trade industries like insurance and healthcare and finance do you see apprenticeships becoming more common in the united states i think apprenticeships are a terrific model and i think that for an employer who has the ability to hire people in, a, in any size cohort, it can be three or five or seven or 10 and move them up as they learn more into different position titles and higher wages. It works really well. 
obviously there are some employers who just don't have that progression. You know, there are, there are fewer jobs going up as you move up the pyramid. So they don't have that ability to move people up. So for them, there are other models that I think could work as well. And to bring people into the program, in, into your company, things like paid internships can be done on a smaller scale, but the, they do the same thing. Things like bringing people in and having uh, uh, a way to simulate what happens so that you can watch them in the simulation and see how they would do. And then I really think uh, the most profound example is real partnerships. We have so many great partnerships out there that are public private partnerships that get people the skills they need and get them right into the workforce. You know, whether it's somebody like Perscolis, whether it's somebody like City who does all ages in technology, whether it's somebody like uh, Year Up that I talked about before that does it with cohorts of just young people. Or whether it's people, you know, AARP is stepping into this with those older workers and building real partnerships with community colleges. They call their program 50 plus, bringing those older workers in who already have the employability skills, who for the most part know how to do a job and how to work in a team, always customizable. But those community colleges, instead of working on just associate's degrees, are customizing the skills that those regional employers need and getting those older workers right in. I think the, that partnership model is is the way that is really more universal than either internships or apprenticeships. Not to delete the you know diminish the importance of those, but when you talk about scalable, any community can create a partnership between employers who have talent needs and educational or nonprofits who can at educational institutions or nonprofit institutions who can provide the skill base and perhaps even you know the ability to screen people for the personal qualities that an employer may want they might want you know one employer may really want diversity may one employer may really want a very specific skill set those in those partnerships the employer can share the risk and i think get a better result i i love that idea one it, it reminds me of something that I came across and it's the first time I saw anything like this, but I wanted to ask you about it. And so often in these conversations, the challenge has been, well, who do I talk to? How do I begin the discussion to bring our two organizations or our, our group, our collaborative effort together to get started? But I, I came across an article the other the other day that talked about how um, like uh, universities were competing with associations on some of the workforce development programming. And it makes, it does make sense, although it was the first time that I saw it kind of presented that way. And so I wanted to ask you, are you, have you seen that? Is that was that just kind of a random no. article or, or are these things actually, you know, is this an issue? So I think we have to begin with the fact that we're all human beings and we have you know, personalities and personalities play a big role in who can be the best convener in, in this, this space, who can get people to the table. The reason, and I'm a huge believer in community colleges. I think they serve an amazing purpose in the communities that are lucky enough to have them. But when it comes to figuring out who the right person is to get to, I think that's where associations have a unique ability. If you were to bring 10 people into a room that represented post-secondary education, secondary education, and nonprofits, they would tell you that their biggest problem, I believe, is getting to the right person. Who's the right person to make this happen in the most efficient way? Well, I think associations, because they're not just conveners, 
for instance, like many educational organizations, are presidential organizations. Only the presidents of the institutions belong, or only the deans, or only the, you know, the people who are business managers. Associations, the business is their partner. That's their member. And everybody in that business is considered a member. So they could figure out how to get to the head of HR, whether that person's title is chief human resource officer or whether their title is something where you wouldn't really know they were the talent coordinator because the business was so small. I think they have the ability to direct the people from the the other partners to the correct person to get the job done in in the best way, not only the quickest way, but the most meaningful way. So that's why I'm such a believer in associations. I I think that if we were to turn the table and say to the business associations, who's the right person to get to in higher education, that would be a much more difficult question to answer Mm -hmm. like in a blanketed way, because, you know, so many community colleges separate their workforce is their workforce enterprises from their academic enterprises. You're not quite sure who's right unless they have the exact title that fits your search. And the same way I would say with four year institutions, you know, you have uh, if, if you're lucky enough to have a four year institution in your region that has an innovation department or a, a business incubator, that's really simple. But that's few and far between. So to go to an engineering dean is a very different thing than to figure out how you get to the person who's doing the right thing in technology. Because is it in computer science? Is it in applied technology? Where is it? So I really think that the the education arm of this has to do a better job at being more transparent about who are the people at that institution who are most interesting in partnering with business. Yeah, I, you know, you raise some interesting points with that. And, you know, one of the things I have heard people working in associations stress out about the the issue with trying to identify the right people to try to, to begin these talks with. And so how can associations for the association executive who's listening to this and say, they say, I want to do more and I'm wanting to reach out and I want to make it easier for these schools to work with us. What are some ways that they can do that? How can associations make it easier for schools to work with them? Well, it, I would be remiss since I had my time at labor and I really do believe in the public workforce system, not to start with them. I think, and again, there are great local job centers and there are mediocre local mm-hmm. job centers. And But I think that's the place to start. I think that going to the American job centers, the workforce investment boards, and saying to them very explicitly, I need help in connecting with education. How can you help me? I think that being direct about it and not, you know, beating around the bush is the most efficient way. So I would start with the public workforce system. I would then go, I I know this is going to sound funny to people because it seems that people don't think government works, but I would go to local government, whether it was the mayor's office or the county office, they really care uh, and they usually run the economic development entities in a, in a local region. They really care not only about attracting business, which gets lots of hype. You know, when Amazon was doing HQ2, everybody knew that that was happening. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, like that was that was the tsunami of interest. Oh, but for sure. They, yeah, they care deeply about making sure that the businesses who have chosen to be there thrive. And therefore, they're going to say to that business, what is it, I, if they're working well, they're going to say to that business, what is it that we can do to help you do that? And if the business comes in and says, I want to partner with education, the the county office or the mayor's office, or in some cases, the governor's office, you know, in single states where the governor, they're small enough where the governor's office is really managing statewide. I think they're a great place to go. And and finally, I would I would go within my association 
to talk to other businesses who had a similar problem to mind connecting and see how they fixed it. You know, how did they, who was the person they connected with? Because maybe, you know, if, if I'm a small business in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I did it this way, maybe the connector that I had at my community college, my K-12, my four-year college has a colleague where I am in Omaha, Nebraska, who can help me connect. I, you know, never associations should know better than anybody the power of networking and maybe, you know, using the network of a colleague to connect you to a local network through their partners may be a way that works very well for you. This is a sort of a shot in the dark question, but one of the one of the challenges that I run into when I'm talking with associations who are wanting to train, they're wanting to provide training to their association members to offer to, you know, all of their member companies. But while they're wanting to offer free training or, or, you know, this benefit, a lot of the pushback that they get is that employers are afraid that they are teaching their current employees how to become future employees for other people, <laughs> for, for their competitors. Does that make sense? So, Absolutely. Um, right. So, um, you know, I do run into that, and that's something that a lot of associations are, are sort of challenged by because they want to provide this beneficial education, continued learning that everyone's going to, to rate very highly. And yet the ones, the companies that are paying for the membership are saying, oh, but don't do too good of a job because then our employees are going to get hired out. What do you have to say to that? Well, it's hard to ignore because poaching has yeah. become the strategy of the 21st century, particularly in high demand, low talent pool areas like technology. But, you know, in certain seasons, billing and coding in healthcare is just as is just as ugly. And the things that people will uh, leave for is is amazing. You know, the the short term benefit versus the long term gain. So, I mean, look, I, I think that. It starts with the climate at the corporate level. You know, do people feel like there's a future for them in that company? And is this a way to build the pathway to that future? Or is this a way to build the, the off ramp to another company? I mean, I, I think that, I, I think that's very interesting. I do think that right now employers are feeling the strain. Uh, on town demand to such a great extent that this idea of building your own talent from within, which I've always been a, uh, a fan of, but really investing in incumbent workers is the way of the future. They already love your company. They, most of them, they already, <laughs> you know, want to build their life there. And right. uh, this new training opportunity just gives them a way a little to give themselves a little more security that they have the same uh, valued place in your future that they have in your present. But I do think it's, it's fair to say that people, when they get higher skills, could consider leaving. But what I think the employer has to look at when an association is doing that training is that other like companies' employees are being trained as well. And you have the opportunity to have yourself seen as the employer of choice. So instead of looking at the glass half empty, that you could have employees leave your company and go to a competitor. Remember, if the association is doing it, your competitor's employees could see you as the next place they want to be. I think for good employers that it should balance out. And I don't think that should be a deterrent either to associations really offering high quality training that's very targeted to their members' needs. And I don't think it should be a deterrent to those member companies seeing this as a value add of membership in the association. 
Well, that's good news because it's definitely something that I have heard from all kinds of different industries, glass manufacturing, yeah. uh, <laughs> risk, uh, risk management. Oh my gosh. So uh, definitely concern when, you know, we are trying to make sure that we develop the talent pool and, and develop, you know, workers that are the ones that we want to keep keep within our organizations. Yes, that's right. That's right. It is a battle for talent out there. I don't want to minimize that. It is ugly. And I totally understand people's fears. But I really believe that if you are a good employer, who's focused on, you know, the growth of your company, number one, and you recognize that the growth of talent in your employees is a key determinant in the growth of your company. I think, I think you're going to end up at least even and maybe winning because I, I just think that again, I go back to we're all human beings. We don't like change. So especially workers who are invested in the commute, your community, workers who have, you know, laid a stake started a family or have a network of family there, they don't want to leave. And uh, I, I think I think it's going to be the minority of workers who really start jumping around. And I believe that across ages. I don't buy this millennials are different or Zs are different. I think mm-hmm. people, there are certain personality types that are across all age groups. And I think people like stability as long as they th- see growth potential in that stable employer. I so agree. You would love a podcast interview I did with David Allison on value graphics, how they're so much more relevant than going by demographics or, or right. generational generational stereotypes. But yes, absolutely. I think, yeah, when you when you look at what people value, um, you can actually get a lot closer to hitting the nail on the head on um, what's going to work, what's going to work and what's going to attract those people and keep them loyal to, to your organization's culture too. No, I think that's exactly right. And it's all about having the right mix, regardless of your size. It's about having the right people feeding information to the CEO or the boss, you know, whether that boss is the owner whether it's a publicly traded company or a mom and pop, all of those companies have tremendous value in our country. But if the, if the leaders aren't listening to the employees in the, you know, you can talk about unions and labor market organizations that do that very well, but I've seen it done in union and non-union companies where the, the, the person who's doing HR and talent development in the company has the ear of the owner of the company and there's a continuous feedback loop, how our employees are feeling, how what skills they think they need to have to do the job better, who knows how to improve work better than the people who are at the front line. And for me, that's the same if you're working in government or you're working in manufacturing or financial services or healthcare. You know the needs if you're a frontline worker. You see what's working and you see what's not. But if the C-suite is not, hasn't embedded a structural continuous improvement feedback loop, they're floating in the wind. They don't know what, what would help their business grow and they don't know what would help their employees uh, be retained at a higher level. So I'm going to actually, before I wind this up with you, I'm going to ask you a question that is just a little bit more personal. And that has to do with every single day you are hearing stories from people and hearing from solution providers about exciting new things or maybe new challenges that they're facing. And so I'm curious, and I'm sure a lot of people are, what is it that's got you fired up right now? What are some things that are maybe happening right now or on the horizon that you're excited about when it comes to, you know, dealing with handling workplace challenges, the future of work? Well, I'm, I'm really excited about some of the solutions that are developing, you know, some of the innovation that's happening. I always, I've always been a great believer in the power of the American worker and the, the 
innovation, the creativity, the entrepreneurship that is the American spirit. I've always been a big fan of business. I've never seen business as an enemy. I've seen them instead as a great provider of opportunity. So all of a sudden I see a lot. And of course, I come from an education background, right? Before I had any of these other titles, I was a teacher, a ninth grade special ed teacher. And when I see these three things coming together in communities, you know, here in the, I, I live in the DC region, what CoLab is doing in Atlanta, what the Atlanta Committee for Progress is doing in Arizona, what the Talent Pipeline Management Program is doing with the U.S. Chamber. Uh, when I when I look at these things, I just get really excited. I just came from a meeting with uh, a staffing agency uh, that has created Talent Path, which is a a program for to to take high functioning, not most elite university graduates and give them a targeted uh, experience in training, a deep dive in training and place them as staffing work, you know, through their staffing association, but giving them that both that job experience and the targeted training they need. Boy, when I leave that, that kind of meeting, I am just so ginned up that not only (laughs) can we get more people into family sustaining wage jobs, but I am really ginned up because I I think American business can retain that top of the world standing that we have had for all of my lifetime. It makes me very excited that business isn't winning over the worker, but they're winning together. And for me, that's a perfect world, right? That's a perfect world when education is helping business and they're both helping workers and workers are helping themselves or potential workers, and we're getting a better outcome for all three. I love that. Thank you so much for talking with me today. I really appreciate the time. And if people want to reach out to you, uh, what's the best way for them to to reach you? Sure. WorkingNation.com is our website, even though we're a nonprofit, or JNotes at WorkingNation.com, either one. And Kiki, thanks so much. I really hope I added some value. And I hope even more that you'll continue to give me feedback about Working Nation's work. And you're listening, your listeners will look at WorkingNation.com or Working Nation on YouTube to see some of our videos and give us feedback. Are we getting it right? What are we missing? And what else should we be doing? You got it. I'll take up the charge and I'm sure everyone else will too. Thank you, Jane. Thanks, Kiki. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Association Chat. If you like it, please subscribe or better yet, tell a friend. You can join the Association Chat book club or support Association Chat by visiting Association Chat's Patreon site. You can also find more information about live events, private communities, special projects, and more on associationchat.com. See you next time. Hey, Association Chat is in its 10th year and independently owned and produced by me, Kiki Letalien, and a very small crew of freelancers and volunteers. We appreciate our sponsors like you wouldn't believe. So I want to give a special thanks to all of our sponsors. Today, that includes Boulder, Event Waves, and Amplified Growth. Thanks to all of you. And if you want to find out more about sponsorship, then go to associationchat.com or email me kiki at amplifiedgrowth.net and we'll be happy to talk with you. All right. Thanks.